Looks like we have quite a few folks joining on with us now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to this webinar hosted by Organic Farmers Association. My name is Allie Lynn and I'm the Membership and Outreach Coordinator for OFA. The mission of OFA is to provide a strong and unified national voice for domestic certified organic producers. And OFA aims to build and support a farmer-led national organic farmer movement and national policy platform. We are a membership organization, so you can join us as a farm member, supporter member, or an organization. And we encourage all of you to be a part of this national movement. Uh, more information can be found on our website as well. Today, we're excited to have John Bobby speak about how corn and soy imports impact U.S. production. And fraudulent imports have been undercutting our U.S. organic farmers, and U.S. organic farmers and consumers deserve better protection from our government. So John will provide us with an overview of U.S. organic corn and soy production and how imports affect these crops, along with some insight on fraudulent imports over the past five years. John was one of our founding members of Organic Farmers Association as a member of our steering committee. John was the executive director of Organic Farmers Agency for Relationship Marketing, or otherwise known as OFARM, where he was committed to the promotion of fair, equitable, and profitable farm gate prices for all segments of organic production. In the 1990s, as National Farmers Organization's agriculture economist, John worked on ag policy analysis and development at the state and national levels, including international trade. His work includes economic research, development of working papers, and testimony before appropriate government bodies, including the US Congress and USDA. John holds a master's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a BS in agribusiness from University of Wisconsin, Rivers Falls. John lives with his wife on his family farm out in Wisconsin. And during John's presentation, we'll have everyone muted. You're welcome to submit questions through the Q&A feature. And we'll have plenty of time for John to answer these questions at the end. Uh, so we'll just hold all those questions till the very end to go over. And now we will have John start his presentation. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you everyone from uh, sunny and cold uh, central Wisconsin where our wind chills are going down to minus 16 tonight and we've got about eight inches of snow. So let's get started uh, about imports. Uh, it first became a problem somewhat in 2015 is when our marketers in Old Farm began to notice that there was not quite the demand for especially organic corn and soybeans. And that's what we'll primarily talk about today because we only import about 14% of our wheat. And the reason is that wheat is very specific to uses and uh, rather than imported, the uh, industry has relied on domestic production, whether it be for pasta or bakery products and so on. So we import about 40% of our organic corn. And depending on the uh, numbers, they range anywhere else from 70 to 90% of our organic soybeans. And there's no reason to believe that that has changed very much with increasing demand. This is the very first ship that we uncovered. We, it was back in May of 2016 the Nakagawa, it came into Burns Harbor, Indiana. We uncovered it quite by accident. At that time, we had no reason to believe or suspect there might be fraud involved, nor do we have any way of proving it. That cargo was unloaded in uh, Burns Harbor, Indiana, and then uh, by unit train went to California. But that's the first one that we uncovered quite by accident. Um, this is the one from uh, Stockton, California that has received the most uh, publicity. It's a the Mount Park that docked in Stockton, which has been a hotbed of imports. And uh, it originated in the Black Sea region, the cargo. 
uh, and its owners were prime suspects, have been prime suspects of uh, a lot of, not only of all of the grain, and I want to say that not all imports are fraudulent, but they're highly suspicious from the black, especially the Black Sea region. This ship, uh, we turned it in two weeks in advance of its arrival. Uh, it sat out in San Francisco Bay for almost 60 days. Uh, APHIS and uh, Customs and Border Patrol boarded it. Uh, they got in a loss. The USDA was sued by the owners of the cargo, not whether it was organic or not, but whether to which degree the corn was cracked or not, or whole kernel. And I'll get into that, why that's important. And then it was sent out uh, rejected and sent out, and it ended up in England uh, with an entity called Feed Factor. Now, we asked the USDA to transmit that information to the Euro Ukrainian or uh, United, uh, United Kingdom authorities or our contacts over there, a farm organization of organic farmers. They refused to do it. Feed Factors is the major importer uh, from and the company that owned the cargo on this ship is a major supplier to them in the United Kingdom and they don't produce very much of their own uh, grain. And Feed Factors, to see the web this is weaved, is owned by a $6 billion commodity trading company in Overland Park, Kansas, the Lansing Company. So there you begin to see the thread and the weave as far as uh, international uh, trade is concerned uh, in this thing. Eventually the lawsuit was withdrawn, but that's technically the last ship that we got turned around and there's a number of reasons why. There have been others that we did before this uh, with the USDA. Matter of fact, before we started tracking and turning them in as complaints, the USDA said they didn't track, even track ships. And uh, they were telling us that, well, there was no problem. Most of you are aware of the Peter Wariski article in the Washington Post, which we had a hand in, and I worked with Peter on uh, uh, about that. And uh, the bottom line that uh, turned out he showed how fraudulent it was and what was getting in the grain in, in our supply chain here. Uh, this is the most recent one, which Kate also had a hand in, the marine vessel Andalusia in Moorhead, North Carolina on May 13th. Ofan turned and I turned in a complaint about the 1st of May that it was coming in. It docked uh, and uh, there were people that made calls, not only uh, we made them USDA aware of it, and also uh, the North Carolina Grain Inspection Service, people in North Carolina were concerned about it, as were some calls to uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Interestingly enough, the National Organic Program told those other agencies, leave your hands off and don't even look at the paperwork. And the day after this cargo was unloaded, the uh, uh, certifier lost its accreditation by the NOP control union after what they said was a two-year investigation. And it just seems coincidence that that way they didn't have to deal with this cargo, which was all oh, same ownership as the Mount Park car cargo uh, is concerned uh, out of the Black Sea region in Turkey. And that's some of the problems that we get into with the National Organic Program. Now, what has this had? Uh, it continues to this day as far as the impact on organic corn and soybean prices. In 2014, organic feed grade corn was $12 a bushel. Today, as of right now, farmers, if they want to fire sale their corn, might get $7.50 a bushel. And it might correct itself a little bit to $8, $8.50. Now this is on feed grade. Food grade is a little bit more because uh, that corn is not imported. But over the period from about uh, when these imports started coming in to today, the I would estimate the cost to US producers in losses is about 750 million to a billion dollars 
from lack of integrity and enforcement in the supply chain. And what's going on here is that the uh, industry buy side has been relegating U.S. domestic production to the residual supply and bringing it in primarily in poultry and somewhat uh, for feed use in some of the big dairies that uh, also come under scrutiny for the pasture rule and origin of livestock because they're located in Texas, among others. Soybeans in 2014 feed grade were 25 to $26 a bushel. Today they're in that 18 to 1875 a bushel makes them a little more expensive than the imported, but it's a little bit different uh, story about the soybeans. Some of these ships coming in carry both soybeans and uh, corn. Uh, most of the soybeans are coming from India currently, but there is some out of the Black Sea region as well. Now, Europe has enacted a high-risk protocol making it more difficult to commit fraud in what they've done and uh, so therefore our sources in Europe tell us that grain is being diverted to the U.S. as an easy target and the problem is an entire shipload of grain if you get caught the fines are $11,000 not much of a detriment when the potential profits on each shipload that comes in here is four million dollars as estimated by Peter Wariski. Now the NOP has been taking some steps on the basis of the 2018 Farm Bill that was signed into law just before Christmas. And there's sort of, uh, I'm going to go through the sleight of hand about this because of, of what they've had the authority since 2018 to do, and they're just getting around to it right now. In May 2019, the NOP cited that 2018 grain imports from the Black Sea region were down to 21% of what they were previously. And yet, we uh, supplied the, uh, by that, uh, a colleague from the industry from February to April of 2019, grain imports from that same region by the same companies involved were up over 30 percent or 150 metric tons from in February, March, and April alone, and yet the U.S. NOP is out here saying they're down. And the transparency of the NOP is something that anyone involved as these rule, future rules come out is going to have to keep in mind because the NOP was citing whole kernel corn imports. Now, every type of import into this country has a trade code, uh, a general agreement on tariffs system, a GATT system, they call it, that has a code assigned to it. And whole kernel corn requires a lot more scrutiny because of the potential for pests uh, housed in there, whereas if you crack it, it becomes uh, more suitable uh, uh, to expose the pests. The problem with the cracked corn is it's more difficult to unload in these big ships. So what are importers doing? They're playing the game by labeling the corn as cracked corn, which receives a different scrutiny by Customs and Border Patrol, and what they're hoping is less scrutiny than the whole kernel corn. But if you take the combined whole kernel corn and cracked corn numbers, that would total up that imports really haven't changed or in fact have increased when the NOP was playing the game of citing whole kernel corn and it was going down. Now, Jenny Tucker recently spoke at the Packers Global Organic Produce Expo in Miami Beach, Florida, and she trumped the USDA's latest attempt to get at organic fraud as Quote, the rule will be a game changer. This is at the Office of Management and Budget now. Nobody's seen what the proposal is. The 2018 Farm Bill was very explicit about what they have to do in that Farm Bill. And it will supposedly inc uh, create increased accountability and visibility, fewer exemptions with increased handler certifications, a requirement for all imports to have certificates and enhanced oversight of accreditation and certification. 
But the NOP has been foot dragging on enforcement. The NOP was given one year to get the rules in place for the new authority the 2018 Farm Bill gave them. They waited until the very last minute of that year to send a proposal to the Office of Management and Budget for review. It could be tied up in OMB for weeks or months before the proposal comes back, months for comments and more time for review of the final rules it could actually be late 2020 or 21 before there's any rules in place when they wanted the authority in 2018. The NOP has demonstrated a repeated lack of institutional will to act, even given the proper authority. Uh, they want to shove the responsibility onto certifiers so the NOP doesn't have to act, and there's an inability on the part of the NOP to think outside the box. The NLP has never, ever taken action on a major international company. They've resorted to taking action against certifiers, thinking that that's going to solve the problem. And my conclusion is the NLP neither has the institutional power or the will. They will always opt for the easy off-ramp of a settlement, which ends up being cosmetic. And currently, they're touting the revocation of certificates but they have no adequate system to prevent simply running off more certificates on a copy machine or a computer. And there are reports from the Foreign Agricultural Service uh, that uh, did a report on uh, Turkish organics that cites rampant fraud in, that, uh, in Turkey alone, much less the Ukraine and Russia in the Black Sea region. Now the NOP is hanging its hat on electronic certificates. They are a step in the right direction, but not the total solution unless it's done right. Those intent on cheating the system are always two steps ahead of the NOP. Simply wiring off an e-certificate may not address all the issues and ways to circumvent the system. The NOP weaknesses are illustrated by the Randy Constant case in Missouri, which everybody is familiar with, where they committed fraud right on, uh, under the certifier and NOP's nose for over 10 years. A friend made a call to the prosecutors in that case and asked what did the NOP to do to uncover it. The NOP quite simply did not uncover the fraud. It was uh, a suspicious buyer who reported the fraud to authorities. And the NOP has frequently missed detecting the fraud, even though in Jenny Tucker's own words to me, the system is working. NF, uh, NOP has some inherent conflicts of interest also. Employees working for the industry after leaving the NOP, uh, one of Miles McAvoy is currently reportedly a consultant for one of these major companies that's involved potentially in the fraud. And you can imagine what's going to happen. The NOP gets a complaint and they're going to call their old pal Miles and there's no need to investigate further because Miles is going to say everything is okay. And if something does happen, he's only a consultant anyway. That kind of conflict of interest is dangerous and has to come to a stop. Now, if you think organic grain is fraudulent, then you ought to try organic fruits and vegetables. The fraud and potential for fraud is probably even greater than imported grain. There's been some publications about that. Uh, there are several investigations have shown that this is, uh, this is the case. And if they can't track a shipload of grain coming in this country, how are they gonna track straight trucks coming across the border from Mexico or flying in on planes. Again, these are issues that NOP is going to have to address. Now, if the NOP does not take into account every step in the supply chain, the fraud will continue. If one of the largest companies suspected of fraud is vertically integrated, how will they, meaning the NOP, break into that chain and where and which direction are they going to look? Once a grain arrives at the U.S. ports and, and unloaded, NOP says it has virtually it is virtually impossible to trace the grain from there. And how will the NOP detect if the e-certificate is sent and the cargo is fumigated in route? 
This goes back to how will they access the ship's logs, which are a key in the supply chain? How will they assess the cargo is legitimate and organic? And will there be a washed ship affidavit like grain producers on the farm are required to do uh, with uh, the trucks being washed and the farmer required to inspect it? I have a, a cousin that is a retired merchant marine captain for one of the Maersk line, which is one of the major shipping lines that this grain comes in on. Now, he did not command a, a grain ship recently. This was more in uh, defense. But he took me through one evening what goes on on a ship and where are they going to possibly miss uh, things if they don't get a handle on it. They could send an, you know, the seller could send an E certificate off when the ship is loaded and then turn around and give instructions to the ship's captain or the first mate to fumigate it as necessary on the way over. And unless they catch it on this end with Customs and Border Patrol, it'll be fumigated and nobody will know about it. Another issue is what is that cargo insured for? There's only one or two insurers in the world that will insure cargo. Uh, the shipping line does not insure the cargo. It's a responsibility of either the buyer or the seller to insure that cargo. And uh, no insurance company in their right mind is going to insure a conventional load of grain that could be fraudulently sold as organic at the higher organic rate. It just isn't going to happen. And so those are all kinds of things in the supply chain that they're going to have to start thinking about. Now, organic feed grade soybeans are a whole different ball game. And that is that the imports of organic soybeans primarily from India appear to be up over 300% in the last years. Now, there are some from Russia, there's some from the Ukraine and the Black Sea region, but the US and India have a trade agreement the U.S. has to accept without inspection on the ground or supervision of certifiers in India that the soybeans meet U.S. organic standards. Originally, that uh, agreement was tucked into a highly classified nuclear proliferation agreement in 2008 that we negotiated with uh, India and only in the last couple of years has been made public. I have had conversations with company people that have been on the ground in India that tell a story, different story of what is actually going on. You've got birds in the facilities with bird droppings, rodents, rampant uh, dirt, and unsanitary conditions. And that's all being loaded up. And in some cases, they have ships that are coming out of the Black Sea with some corn and they, have, they meet in a place like Dubai and they load the cargo with soybeans and then it comes into the, into the US. And so that's another issue that's going to have to be uh, dealt with. Now, I've said it's time for har farmers to haul out the pitchforks and I don't mean that as physical violence. I mean that in that uh, my experience in the last uh, five years is dealing with the NOP They've made some steps in the right direction, but uh, they're going to have to herd the NOP to do its work. And you've seen that time and time again with the pasture rule, the origin of livestock. And the NOP has an institutional and cultural atmosphere that has been shown not to protect organic integrity, unfortunately. And farmers and consumers may have to consider alternatives such as the Real Organic Project or the Rodale approach, which is regenerative to move beyond the NOP to ensure organic integrity. Because uh, with the current state of affairs in Washington, we've all seen what a big mess it is. And uh, how is the NOP going to get the institutional background to settle? And one of these companies that's uh, huge by standards that claims to be one of the biggies in the world is a billion and a half dollar entity that imports located in Turkey out of the Black Sea region. The NOP 
does not have the backbone or, in my opinion, or the resources to even go up against that because we've seen this time and time again. I know exactly which lawyer I would, in law firm, I would go to in Washington, D.C. and get them off the hook. And that's something that has to stop if we're going to correct this. I keep coming back to uh, all of my life has been involved from the standpoint of farmers and the fact that 750 million to a billion dollars in losses and we're basically right back where we were uh, with some cosmetics as when we started uncovering this back in 2015 or 2015. And an old farmer adage is what is most often done for farmers ends up being done to them. And if farmers aren't careful and take an interest in it as their business, right now what's happening with $7.50 corn, farmers had a bad year weather-wise, the test weights are light, the quality of the corn is poor. Some of it didn't get harvested. Acres didn't get par harvested. The same thing with uh, soybeans. And what's happening is the industry is using that as an excuse to further beat the prices down. And we all talk about the need to grow the organic industry. Uh, this is absolutely the wrong direction. And that's why consumers are gonna have to get involved in this as well as farmers and their organizations in order to make this uh, make this happen. And with that, one other uh, amusing thing, and that is uh, what does the USDA do for this mess that's been created here? Well, some employees got as much as a $2,000 bonus for their work in 2018 and the numbers for 2019 are not out but it's according to the uh, website federalpay.org and you can plug in what they are and you can find out who it is but farmers are getting out of the business turning over their farms and are going conventional and not getting in you it's a dis uh, uh, a sheer disappointment for young farmers that we want to get in and grow the industry and yet this institution is out there handing out bonuses for a job well done that cost farmers probably a billion dollars in losses. And I think that's time to stop. So with that, uh, let's uh, have some questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. I'm happy to read some of the questions we have coming in so far. And for those of you who haven't submitted any, uh, please feel free to do so in that question and answer icon you have. Our first question for John is, do you know why the NOP won't give a company a non-compliance or fine for fraudulent imports? Well, I can't say for sure that they didn't, uh, but it would appear to be, uh, appear that uh, what they, the, they opt to do is go for a settlement uh, rather than getting a long drawn out uh, court case where they have been taken to court uh, in the case of the cert Turkish certifier ETCO, they ended up settling because their case was so poorly put together that uh, it would have been basically thrown out and they wouldn't have had any uh, anything left to stand on. They come along and put the cosmetics on it that, that it was uh, wasn't was good but that's what needs to happen. They have yet to uh, confront a company with a billion, a billion and a half dollars worth of sales, other than trying to revoke the accreditation of the certifier. And after the accreditation is done, that's another thing that needs to be addressed in this whole thing. Three weeks later, the company had a new certifier and I understand they've got another certifier after that and that's uh, the issue. Uh, another question, uh, I'm just going down the list here if that's all right, is who is best equipped to track fraud on imported fruits and vegetables? Is there any entity like Old Farm watching imported organic fruits and vegetables? I'm not very familiar with it. There, uh, uh, I, People from the fruit and vegetable industry call me because they want to understand how brain fraud 
occurs because they want to use that as a pattern to look at uh, vegetables. The only study, I, there's one study that's been done by a entity called NerdWallet. It's N-E-R-D-W-A-L-L-T.com. You can go to their website. They did an in-depth uh, study about fruits and vegetables and the corruption that uh, goes on there. Uh, Amer I believe it's the American Vegetable Grower, their uh, editor talked to me last fall, I think in October, there was a uh, article that came out uh, about it again for an investigation about fraud, but that's all I know. I don't think there's uh, any uh, watchdog uh, that I'm aware of, there, there may be. Uh, again, this is, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say that the certifiers are all bad in this because that's supposed to be the first line of defense. But how do you get a certifier even to audit a company that has a billion and a half dollars worth of sales? Um, the next question, how can the U.S. have an organic trade agreement with India that doesn't allow for supervision and auditing of certifiers in India? Well, there's a nub, and, and the second part of it, the NLP just spent two weeks in India doing some sort of training. Apparently, they're acknowledging the problem. And uh, the, just a minute here, I got to dismiss my, I put my timer on to get done early. Anyway, uh, uh, it, there are several different types of agreements that we have in the world. One of them is similar to the European one we have with Europe, that our standards are not exactly the same. It's two-year transition in Europe, but we agree that uh, versus three as a, uh, uh, three as an example, there's some other differences there that we tend to accept them as being equivalent. Then there's individual country agreements, and then there are there's a third type, and I I don't recall what that uh, what that is. Um, and I'm glad to see and hear that the NLP spent two weeks in India doing some sort of uh, training. Um, again, this all came about because somebody in India was a lot sharper apparently than people in the U.S. That hey, we want to trade, we want to sell organic soybeans to the U.S. and let's put it in this secretive treaty. Uh, until recently. Uh, let's go on to the, what is the biggest fine the NOP can issue a company for a violation? I believe it's $11,000 per incident. I'm at the end of my questions. I don't know if anybody, if there's more questions coming. We'll give folks just a minute here. If you have any last minute questions, feel free to submit them now in that question and answer icon. Uh, while we're uh, waiting here, I will say that there is an article coming out in the March, April of Mother Jones News. I worked with the reporter that uh, put that together. And just to give you an interesting sidelight on this uh, on this whole thing, uh, she had a very interesting take on this, where she asked me to provide her a list of every ship uh, that we filed an old farm a formal complaint with, and there were about thirteen of them over that time. I'm not saying we got all the ships. I'm just saying that's what people brought to us we uncovered and found it worthy to file a complaint. She filed a Freedom of Information Act with the uh, request with the uh, NOP, asking them what they did specifically or how they acted with those complaints. The NOP came back and said, we have to protect the confidentiality of the client that submitted the claim, the complaints, meaning John Bowlby. And as a result, she, she said to them, well, what if he supplies an affidavit that you can make it public? 
And because all of my complaints, somebody, whether it be Kate uh, and other people, Abby at NOC and so on were involved, have known about the complaints that we filed, they're public, and the NOP told them no. And that raises the real question of suspicion when they won't say how they uh, dealt with some of these complaints. Um, the question, do you know if there are tests that would be helpful for Customs and Border Protection to use at the border to try and confirm organic production? Uh, uh, one of the problems, as I understand it, with fumigants, they can be dispersed. The only way to uh, detect that is that that captain on the ship or the first mate have to record everything that happens to that uh, car, uh, that cargo. Um, there have been some tests on GMOs. Matter of fact, we did one on a, a shipment, a rapid test, uh, and that uh, you're, most of these countries in the Black Sea region uh, got rid of their GMOs. They're too expensive for their farmers to use. In one case, in Romania, they burned them. Now, a couple other things that are going on with deceit here, and that is that, for instance, we found a load of grain that actually went from the Ukraine, which is a highly suspicious country, over and through Serbia to a port in Romania to try and make it look like the cargo came out of the European Union. Uh, and again, we raised the question because if it had originated in Serbia, uh, the majority of the organic production in Serbia is uh, used for domestic livestock feed and the average farms are 20 acres or less. How do you get an entire shipload out of uh, a country like Serbia? When in fact our sources were, uh, we had some con connections with sources on the ground in uh, Romania when that ship was loaded and saw what the paperwork was that it actually came out of the out of the Ukraine um, Let's see. There's another question here How did old farm become aware of the ships that were rejected in North Carolina and California and what process took place to identify them? Um, basically what uh, What we did is uh, we have some sort there now, don't get me wrong, there are people, some very good companies that do import grain legitimately in this country. And I'm not trying to negate the necessity of imports uh, as long as they're fair and on the level playing field and follow the rules. We don't have a problem with that. But uh, in uh, California, we actually have some sources in California that are very close that want to see this thing cleaned up, and uh, but they don't want their names out in public. Some of the companies that have gone out on a limb have been, there's been uh, uh, back pressure. Uh, Ann Ross did a white paper about uh, the whole teriyaki thing, uh, matter of fact, I can get that to Kate if she wants to, I think to uh, uh, make it available as a resource. And, and also Kate and I did a white paper last September about what the NOP needs to do and, and their shortcomings. And I can make that available for Kate to share, uh, share with people. In the case of North Carolina, um, let's see, I'm not sure how we, came across it. Another, uh, it was another source. We don't necessarily track them. You can, there's a website where you can go called vesseltracker.com. And if you know the name of the ship, in some cases we know by watching the port website because they say what ship is arriving on what date and what the potential cargo is, how long it'll be in the port and so on. And uh, the Stockton, California port is really easy to do that. Some cases it's been uh, newspaper, uh, newspaper articles and uh, 
uh, so that's how we happen to know. Now, Betsy Ricola told us about uh, two years ago in La Crosse when we had a conversation with her. Uh, she said, well, the USDA tried tracking ships, and when they found out it was USDA, it didn't work. Well, let me give some plain, simple, common sense advice here. If you go on a website and start tracking, try to track ships that are potentially fraudulent, and your uh, ending on your email is USDA.gov, don't expect that to go very far. Um, next one is import certificates will be included in the enforcement rule. How will they help? Well, they will help in the sense that uh, it will make, uh, for instance, notification of shipments that are coming in, uh, depending on how they set it up as to who's going to certify, uh, who the certifier is and so on, that it's coming in. And hopefully this new agreement they're negotiating, uh, NOP with Customs and Border Patrol, will enable that NOP to start making some of these determinations about what should what they sh uh, should look at uh, as well. Uh, they're already being used in Europe. Uh, some of you have probably been aware of the uh, uh, blockchain, which is being used in, in Europe quite a bit. Uh, it might be helpful for me to just briefly go through what happens. The European uh, Union or European Commission in their high risk protocol memorandum lists the countries that they consider high risk. And they include Russia, Ukraine, and so on. Now, Turkey's not on that list because Turkey basically has no organic production, yet they're the biggest exporter. And the reason is because in the Black Sea region in Turkey, it's a free trade zone where there's basically no government regulation whatsoever. You just bring a ship in, you can do what it, the cargo, whatever you want, ship it out. And uh, if it comes out of one of those countries before they even load the ship uh, out of one of those high risk countries, the information has to be transmitted about the cargo to the appropriate government authority in Europe, whether it be Spain or France or whatever. And then, there are certain testing protocols that they require before the ship is unloaded and a whole list of accountability measures that go with it. And that's where that e-certificate thing would come in is right now, a lot of times the only paperwork as I would understand it, and I'm not a certification uh, expert or much knowledge about it in any way, shape or form is simply uh, that the certifier might know if the shipment is coming in. And so therefore, uh, the e-certificates will be a step in the right direction. And my only point there is that uh, uh, they, uh, they need, the USDA NOP needs to think entirely the big picture. And they start, they need to start thinking like criminals, excuse me, because so far, the, those intent on committing fraud are usually about two steps away, uh, two steps ahead. And so they're going to have to start thinking about what additional uh, things. Now, one of the things I believe that's not included in the farm bill was this idea of swapping uh, certifiers in a big hurry. If you get in trouble with one, you turn around and everything stops and it goes. Hopefully that is going to be corrected in following wherever that uh, entity goes, whether it be the certifier or whether it be that particular entity. I'm at the list end of my list of questions unless there are more. Anyone else have some last minute submissions? Uh, there's one more. Um, I thought that the 2018 Farm Bill included a $5,000 increase for NOP specifically for a database, which I thought would be blockchain or something like the EU traces, but Jenny said that would not be included in the enforcement rule. Um, that 
$5,000 was to upgrade the organic integrity database. And that's what they chose to uh, do first is update the integrity database. And when people are supposed to submit some of that information, I think all of us will agree was totally out of date. And I'm not sure if, uh, if they, uh, I assume that that's what they tackled first, and and then went at the uh, where the, where they're at where they're at um, now, and so there. But there is also increased funding through that farm bill for the NOP for additional hiring, uh, additional training, and stuff like that uh, uh, as well. Uh, I'm not certain, I don't believe that addresses the whole issue of blockchain. Blockchain, uh, they talk about it. I've talked to one of the originators out of Germany. Italy is using it. Uh, it's been talked about a little bit. Uh, matter of fact, uh, they're in Indiana, they had a, we're going to do a pilot at Purdue University with it that was rejected for funding. Uh, uh, the Computer software that Customs and Border Patrol uses is called ACES, or ACE, A-C-E. And uh, uh, I forget what the exact acronym is. If you do a Google on it, you'll come up with it. But as it was explained at the uh, NOSB meeting uh, that I was on a panel on, is that all of the agencies in the USDA that are involved with imports in some way, shape, or form have agreements with this system. And what it allows them to do is for Customs and Border Patrol to share information with that agency. What are the rules? What are the guidelines, the agreement? And so as an example, meat imports, as an example, fall under that. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, commodity checkoffs, because the commodity check conventional checkoffs all <laughs> want to assess what's uh, the imports that are, are coming in and they already have agreements. Now this was two years ago that they had this discussion at the uh, NOP or NOSB meeting and they were just getting around to talking about it. Now why the NOP was one of the few that didn't have an agreement already in place, uh, I don't know. But again, they're about two years behind the time as usual. Now hopefully this, I, I have some hopes that this new enforcement rule and the additional funding and so on, that they're going to get a grip on things, but their past record of five years uh, has not been very positive. Uh, let's see if I've got, yes. So without an inclusion of acreage in the organic integrity database, it doesn't really help with the import tracking. Uh, I think you're absolutely correct on that. When I asked Betsy Ricola, I said, how much organic corn is produced in Russia? And her comment to me, this was about uh, well over a year ago was, well, we don't know, we're trying to triangulate that. Now, one of the parts that I've heard about in this whole uh, rulemaking process or process of upgrading uh, what the NOP does is to try and track uh, and compare uh, acreage with climate factors and so on uh, versus what production is actually coming out of that country. And let me give you, the Ukraine is a classic example of that. I was on the ground at an integrity conference in the Ukraine in September of 2017. And what I learned there is that if you take and split the Ukraine, which is a huge, huge country, and draw a line basically east to west, right through the middle, south of that line to the Black Sea, they barely get 12 inches of rain, which will barely allow them for wheat, lentils, and fallow for an organic rotation. At that time, and they probably have more by now, they had 400 certified farms in the UK, in the Ukraine. 80% are tucked up in the Northwest, close to the European Union and shipping their fruits and nuts and berries, vegetables into 
the European Union. Well, that leaves 60 farms, and yet four or five years ago, the Ukraine was the largest supposed supplier of imported or export of grain to the U.S., and how can that be? Uh, the other problem they've got <coughs> is these satellite offices for certifier uh, certifiers over there. Uh, in some cases, it's absolutely too dangerous for them to get out. Uh, you can bet in the main office, the records are all going to be stellar. And in some cases in Russia, they may not even be able to safely travel there. I know when we were had a panel at the Moses Conference in La Crosse, my, at that time, Miles McAvoy spoke as well as myself and uh, our colleague Andrew Trump from the United Kingdom from Organic Arable. And Miles was telling us at that time that the unrest in Turkey was so bad that they couldn't even send anybody in there to do the inspections. Now, I think eventually they did, but this is the kind of uh, uh, thing that exists in that part of the world. And believe me, I have been come after personally uh, with a defamation of character lawsuit by a major player. Uh, we got through that one uh, because they were trying to apply a different country's defamation for something that I said that had qualifiers on both ends is not necessarily being true. I've heard it from being on the ground in the Ukraine that you're dealing with some mighty rough players of international organized crime syndicates in Ukraine, Turkey, and uh, Russia. And uh, my colleague, uh, Ann Ross from the Cornucopia Institute has been in Europe quite a bit the last couple of months and she's heard the same thing that over there in those countries, they don't hesitate to quote, take somebody out if they get in the way. And uh, that is what they do, is they go into a farmer and he may not even, he or she may not even know they're organic, supposedly, and they say, you sell us your grain or we'll make sure you never sell a kernel of corn off your farm again. So what's that farmer to do? And he may not even know that they've rattled off uh, on the copy machine or printer a organic uh, certificate. And that's why, uh, you know, you hear about the USDA and all the certificates that they revoke. Uh, Jenny Tucker and the NOP, they give an update at every meeting, which is basically in some ways very meaningless uh, because they're right back there with the copy machine and, and USDA's own foreign agricultural service says fraud is rampant. So, uh, but the inclusion of acreage and triangulation of the acreage, which they're trying to do, uh, is the right way to go so that when imports get out of hand uh, from a particular re region, it should be raising the flags about extra scrutiny for any shipments that come in. I'm at the end of my uh, list of questions, unless there are any more. All right, I think that probably just about does it for us. I want to thank everyone who joined today, and we really appreciate John's dedication to this work and all of his involvement with Organic Farmers Association. So thank you to John. and. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you for putting up with me. I, I've got, gotten very opinionated, and I guess my heart has always been that I see farmers out here struggling financially at this point that shouldn't be in the organic industry, especially on, uh, from my perspective of grain farmers. And if we want to grow the industry, the message has got to be that you buy domestically because you can be assured of how that grain is grown. Uh, I'm not sure, we might have one more question. Um, the question is, uh, I guess for, for Kate or for yourself, uh, will this presentation be posted? I have no problem with that. Yeah, I can help answer that one. We can absolutely, um, we intend on sending out a copy of this recorded webinar and we'll send it to this list of attendees as well as having it posted on our website under the webinar section. Um, it'll be a YouTube link, so you're welcome to revisit it at any time or feel free to share it um, with folks who might also be interested in it. 
I don't uh, profess to have all the answers, as you can tell, having been uh, battle scarred in this thing for the last five years. Uh, I've got my opinions about it. Uh, if somebody has some corrections, I certainly open to corrections on it. But it's got to be that if we're going to grow the domestic organic industry, our farmers have to be prosperous here, and that is not happening right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John. I also want to note that we have another webinar hosted by Organic Farmers Association this upcoming Tuesday. Um, and our host will be Patty Lavera, who is our policy director. And she will be hosting her webinar on advocating for organic. So we encourage all of you to join this upcoming Tuesday, February 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And again, that registration you can find on our website as well. And I just wanna remind everyone that we are a membership organization. So we do encourage you to join as either a farmer, a supporter member, or if you are involved with an organization, we would love the organization to be involved with us as well. Um, so we encourage all of you to be a part of this movement we're in. and. Um, please feel free to reach out with us with any additional questions. But uh, thank you again for taking an hour out of your time and I uh, hope you enjoyed our webinar.